From the Vatican to the White House and everything in between. It's serious, it's fun, it's your Catholic Drive Time. Now here's your host, Joe McClain. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. Keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McClain. So good to be on with you this Wednesday, December the 28th, 2022, on the feast day of the Holy Innocents. Praise be to God, martyrs for our Lord. Is Hollywood dying? They've lost... A lot of money in 2022, huge amounts of cash, almost as much as uh, the federal government likes to spend. Hollywood is lost. And uh, we're going to have that conversation with Angelo Labuti at 15 past the hour. Uh, He's also going to share an exciting update about their movie on the Eucharistic miracles. Praise be to God. That's coming up at 15 past the hour. Do join us. But here's another great question. Are churches increasingly becoming anti-family? I read an, a wonderful article in Crisis Magazine by August Mayrot yesterday. We've invited him to be on at 35 past the hour to have a conversation about uh, how churches might become very anti-family and how they should turn that around. David L. Gray is going to be on the top of the next hour. He's got an article coming out at 1 Peter 5 soon. 300 years of the church changing its attitudes, embracing and compromising with evil. We're going to have that conversation with David O'Gray in the next hour for those that can join us. Lots of stories in the news, of course. Arizona judge denies request to sanction Kerry Lake over election lawsuit. Okay, that's good. SCOTUS halts the end of the Trump-era Title 42 border policy, keeping it in place until February at the very least. Pope Francis has asked the world to pray for uh, Pope Benedict XVI, who is apparently very sick. No details were given uh, other than to just pray for him. So let's keep Benedict in our prayers today. The CDC uh, has uh, issued uh, a statement saying that overdose deaths are up 14 percent nationally since the pandemic. Another consequence of the great lockdowns. Hey, uh, the, it's being described as the blizzard of the centuries. Uh, authority in the uh, New York state, western New York part of the country, have said that they've recovered at least 18 bodies within the Buffalo city limits alone. Total of 27 dead within the county. At least 51 have died nationwide. And eight people have been arrested for looting in Buffalo. Uh, Buffalo got hit incredibly hard. Let's keep them in our prayers today as they recover. Good morning to you. Uh, Adrian Fonseca. Howdy, howdy. Praise be to God. It's good to be here. Is it? It is. It's a great day to be alive, despite the fact that uh, Joe is trying to uh, mm. bring down the mm-hmm. mood Debbie and the Downer. fact that my uh, microphone just likes to fall apart <laughs> in my you? hands. Every but day. Other than that, it's uh, it's a good day to be alive, you know? I'm noticing a trend that every single day you try to destroy the microphone. Yeah. Why do like, you hate um, microphones? It's like these things are old <laughs> and don't uh, function as they used to. Well, nonetheless, praise be to God. It, we, there, is there good news out there still? Oh, it's Christmas. We know, can say that. You know, there is always good news. Even mm-hmm. amongst the evil and the horribleness, there's mm-hmm. always good news. Like, for mm-hmm. instance, the Feast of the Holy Innocents. You celebrate these uh, poor children who were murdered, and yet we rejoice. 
And so yet we rejoice. There is always hope and there is always joy. Well, praise be to God. We're grateful for everybody hanging out with us today. Uh, thank you for being a part of our program, either on the radio or on the uh, comments section of our live video feed. Hopefully, Rumble will be up in, in soon. Rumble's been growing on our live video feed, and we've been very grateful for that. By the way, do not forget the Guadalupe Radio Network's uh, kicking off its 2023 car raffle. You could win a Mercedes. It's a beautiful car. Go to grnonline.com for the details. But we're going to pray. We're going to jump in. We're going to have two at least great conversations in this hour alone. Angelo Labuti and then August Mayrot are going to be on the program. And as I said, David O'Gray, top of the next hour. Let's pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And now your headlines. Epic Times reports the Supreme Court orders Title 42 border rules remain in effect. The high court voted five to four to grant an emergency request from 19 Republican state attorneys generals who sought to intervene in defense of the rule, putting on hold a ruling by District of Columbia Judge Emmett Sullivan, a Clinton appointee that allowed the rule to expire last week. Justices Neil Gorsuch, Sonia Sotomayor, Elena Kagan, and Ketanji Brown-Jackson voted against granting the request, while Justices John Roberts, Samuel Alito, Clarence Thomas, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett voted in favor. Last week, Roberts, the Chief Justice, paused the plan to give the Supreme Court more time to look into the issue. Breitbart is reporting that the uh, Biden Department of Homeland Security freed over 150,000 border crossers into the United States with no court dates in the summer of 2021. As a part of a lawsuit against Biden's expansive catch and release network, Florida Attorney General Ashley Moody obtained internal DHS footage revealing the extent to which the agency released hundreds of thousands of border crossers and illegal aliens into the United States interior without the need to ever show up in an immigration court. That's a good time. Yahoo News is reporting a second war threatens to explode in Europe. Serbian President Alexander Vucic has this week put his army on its highest level of combat readiness to protect ethnic Serbians across in northern Kosovo, he says, that are under the threat from Kosovo. Vucic says his military will take all measures to protect our people and preserve Serbia. Kosovo was the site of the last war in Europe, which ended when NATO launched a military campaign ordered by then U.S. President Bill Clinton in March of 1999 that lasted for 78 days. The latest tensions come amid warnings that factions in each country could take advantage of the world's attention focused on Russia's war in Ukraine. Ground News reports no conclusive evidence Russia is behind the Nord Stream attack. After explosions in late September, severely damaged undersea pipelines built to carry natural gas from Russia to Europe, world leaders quickly blamed Moscow for a brazen and dangerous act of sabotage. With winter approaching, it appeared the Kremlin intended to strangle the flow of energy to millions across the continent, an act of blackmail some leaders said designed to threaten countries into withholding their financial and military support. But after several months of investigations by several uh, Western countries over the sabotage of the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines, there apparently is no evidence that Russia was behind it. The Washington Post newspaper reported on Wednesday, citing its sources. And those are your headline news. The saints of the day are all ye holy innocents. A summary from Dom Garanger, we have in Blessed Stephen the fulfillment of his desire to be a martyr with the act of martyrdom. In St. John, we find the desire but not the act of martyrdom. In the Blessed Innocents, the children Herod killed with the intent to kill the Messiah, we have the act of martyrdom but not the desire. Is there reason to believe that those children were true martyrs? 
Where is the merit to obtain the crown of martyrdom? To this doubt, I answer, would the goodness of Christ be defeated by the cruelty of Herod? Could that impious king order those innocent killed and Christ not crown those who died because of him? Certainly those children were thy martyrs, O God, but neither men nor angels could see their merit, which was before thy eyes alone. The favor of thy grace stood in place of their merit. We who have been baptized by water should be all the more ready to honor those little ones who are baptized in their own blood and therefore linked to all the mysteries of the divine infancy. This feast day of the Holy Innocents also includes all those children who died soon after being baptized and are in heaven. Our epoch is so revolutionary and evil that many children cannot be baptized before they die. First, because of the general paganization of customs, whereby many parents do not care about the spiritual benefit of their children and let them die without being baptized. Second, we have the monstrous practice of abortion that takes the life of children still in the womb of their mothers, or immediately after the child is removed from it. And neither the mother nor surgeon is concerned about baptizing the child in those few moments he is still alive. It is another reason for us to fight against the revolution and against abortion. If we were to have a canonized person in our families, we would be strong devotees of that saint. This is understandable. Now then, in almost all of our families, we have some children, sons or daughters, brothers or sisters, cousins or other relatives, who died soon after being baptized. They are in heaven and able to see God face to face and to perfectly understand our needs. So when we are in difficulties, we should remember those children and ask their intercession. They are the natural patron saints of the families to whom they belonged. It is very advantageous and worthwhile to pray to them and ask them to pray and protect us. All ye holy innocents, pray for us. Praise be to God in all things. The gospel today comes to us from Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 18. When the Magi had departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you. Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Joseph rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. He stayed there until the death of Herod, that what the Lord had said through the prophet might be fulfilled. Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been deceived by the Magi, he became furious. He ordered the massacre of all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity two years old and under in accordance with the time he had ascertained from the Magi. Then was fulfilled what had been said through Jeremiah the prophet. A voice was heard in Ramah, sobbing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children, for she would not be consoled since they were no more. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. St. Augustine would say, O blessed infants, he only will doubt of your crown in this your passion for Christ, who doubts that baptism of Christ has a benefit for infants. He who at his birth had angels to proclaim him, the heavens to testify and magi to worship him, could surely have prevented that these should not have died for him, had he not known that they died not in that death, but rather lived in higher bliss. Far be, the, far be the thought that Christ, who came to set men free, did nothing to reward those who died in his behalf. When hanging on the cross, he prayed for those who put him to death. Close quote, St. Augustine. St. Augustine's clearly looking at them as martyrs, martyrs for the faith, their blood shed for the Lord. That is an amazing, amazing testament, not only for their martyrdom, 
but also to the reality of what baptism is in the sacrament and what we believe. So the next time you run into somebody who says you Catholics are baptizing babies and the Bible says otherwise, the Bible doesn't say otherwise for starters. And second of all, the early church fathers also believed in infant baptism. So there's that. Remigius said by this, the, that the angel appears always to Joseph in sleep is mystically signified that they who rest from mundane cares and secular pursuits deserve angelic visitations. So in other words, let go of the world around you and uh, embrace and live in a state of grace because maybe you too will enjoy such consolations. Father McEvely points out the most probable arrangement and the one that will most easily reconcile the apparent discrepancy between St. Matthew and St. Luke. Did you know there's a discrepancy? One mentions going to Egypt and the other doesn't. Well, how is this possible? Father McEvely goes on. It is affected by inserting in this place that uh, all that is described by St. Luke in the above passage relative to the purification. After the purification, the Holy Family retired to Nazareth, their native place. It was there the angel appeared to Joseph, and from thence they fled into Egypt in obedience to the angel's uh, uh, admonition in order, among a variety of other reasons, to be altogether outside the dominions of Herod. There is no real discrepancy between St. Matthew here and St. Luke, as the one only omits what the other describes. I like that. Praise be to God. But it was St. Augustine who also said, Hear the sacrament of a great mystery. Moses before had shut up the light of day from the traitors, the Egyptians. Christ, by going down thither, brought back light to them that sat in darkness. He fled that he might enlighten them, not that he might escape his foes. Close quote, St. Augustine. Pray for us. Let's talk about Hollywood with Angela Booty coming up next. Hope. The Catholic Encyclopedia has much to say about hope. Going online to newadvent.org, we see hope explained as the desire and expectation of future good. Each of us prays and looks to the situations and events of our lives with a desire and expectation that something good awaits us. We pray for the ultimate good, a close and intimate relationship with God. During Advent, we also look to the prophecy candle of hope. The prophet Isaiah foretold of the coming of Jesus. As Christians, we must stay firm in our expectation of goodness, for our salvation lies in seeing goodness in people and focusing on our relationship with God. Jesus said that the kingdom of God is now. Like a guiding star in the night, hope is born as we turn our desires and expectations to God. This has been a bit of Catholic encouragement from Michael Gisandi. I turned from a recreational drug user to a drug addict. That took me to my knees. I lost a family, almost two families. I lost friends. Now that I'm back in the Catholic Church, I'm a new person. I love it. I love it. My heart's there. I took communion after 18 years, and I, the rest of the Mass I sat and cried. God restored my life. God restored my family. God restored my love. If you've been away from the Catholic Church for any reason, visit CatholicsComeHome.org today. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Coming up at uh, 35 past the hour, August Mayrod from Crisis Magazine is going to be on. He has an article over there talking about our churches becoming more anti-family. We're going to dive into that. What is it like for young families trying to raise kids and feeling the pressures every Sunday to keep their kids locked down. We're going to have that conversation with August Mayrot coming up. So join us if you can. Joining us right now, though, is our good friend, Angelo Labuti, director of a Eucharistic Miracle film. And uh, we've had him on the conversation about that a few times, but he's got some exciting news to share. And I want to dive into Hollywood. Good morning to you, Angelo Labuti. Good morning. Good morning, guys. Merry Christmas to you, by the way. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of you guys and all, all to the viewers yeah. as well. Praise be to God. Uh, is it uh, a white Christmas there in sunny California? I mean, like, uh, <laughs> is, does it feel weird to have a Christmas that's still like 75 degrees? I'm not, I, how's that work? Now, it's a little bit more chilly. It's a little more cold. I mean, but uh, no, definitely doesn't give it really the, the feeling. But it's okay. It's, it's okay. A, it's a frigid sixty-five. Got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you are releasing a new trailer for your film. Tell us about that. 
Yeah, we just we just did the Spanish version, and uh, we're working to to do the, on on the Portuguese. Wow. Um, so we try to like it, make it aware as much as possible the, about the, the movie. I mean, we we finished to filming all the reenactment of the Bible, which is great stepping stone. Uh, but we still have a lot to go. I mean, to do all the post production and. Uh, Unifying the pieces with uh, um, for for the whole movie to to together, yeah. Wow, that's we get, we're getting closer. Yeah, yeah, very exciting. So, uh, I mean, I, you probably aren't ready to release any like uh, dates or anything, but what do you figure? Another six months or how much more time do you think it'll be? Do you have any idea? I mean, it's it's again, it's all about the donations, my friend. Uh, every time I. I hear the, the the director of the chosen that uh, uh, these guys as soon as they blink uh, they got the ten million dollars <laughs> left and right, and uh, we got we got, we got the two hundred bucks. Uh, <laughs> it's like it's a little bit harder. I mean, yeah. it's like a, a, yeah. One wonders how many of those uh, millions of dollars chosen gets is, comes from Catholics too. I'm sure they're uh, a yeah. big a big chunk. I would imagine the majority of their audience is probably Catholic, as uh, typically the case with those types of productions, and they're giving huge dollars. So, where are you at in the fundraising? How much money do you still need to complete your project? Yeah, we we minimum minimum we need another six hundred. Thousand, uh, we cannot do nothing, and that's is really like it's squishing, squishing the, uh, the the lemon. I mean, it's like it's, as I explained before. I mean, with the fact that uh, there's a, a booming uh, part of it uh, of uh, lots of places that are making so ma so many content, uh, uh, nobody's going to do any more work for free. We yeah. we with all the actors like you, you guys, you met some some of them, and I mean. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, they really did the, everything out of the love for God, but now this stage, uh, you need people professionals. Need yeah, yeah, need to be paid. So uh, I, we cannot do anymore nothing for free. They are not going to do it. <laughs> and what's the website people can go to for information about the project and consider giving you a financial contribution? Yeah, it's uh, www.eucharisticmiraclesmovie.com or the the newmana.com. Newmana.com. Uh, yeah, we try to make it easy for them to. Yeah, and I encourage everyone to do this uh, to support this project. Uh, a movie on the Eucharistic miracles produced at the highest quality is going to really convert many people to the faith. So uh, do consider making a contribution. I want to ask you though, because I saw a couple articles, and then I think are, uh, are somewhat related to this in the sense that we're trying to impact society and culture around us, and I think that's the heart of what your project is is uh, trying to accomplish. And I saw an article yesterday that said Hollywood lost more than $500 billion in market value in 2022. Disney, Netflix being among the greatest uh, uh, organizations in Hollywood that lost the most amount of money, uh, both of which insisted on putting out projects that are completely contrary to what we believe as Catholics, seemingly harming society instead of you know healing society, as your project would do. Uh, how do you see this as somebody who works from within Hollywood? Uh, is Hollywood learning its lessons from woke projects? No, I think I think I think I think they went so far woke that I mean they they don't even understand the. I mean I read I read some of their explanation for why they're failing, and uh, it's hilarious. I mean they are, they absolutely don't acknowledge at all. They are so much trying to fit in uh, their work mentality that uh, they absolutely clueless. And I mean, it's like a, as, as if a train hit, uh, mm. hit them in the head uh, when they were a child. And I mean, it's like a really have absolutely no recognition of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of their, their mistakes. Yeah. You'd think they would learn though, because uh, at the end of the day, money means something to them. Uh, the uh, Tom Cruise film, Top Gun 2 was a box office smash. 
it didn't involve a lot of the woke ideology and agenda that uh, the Marvel films included th this year. The I was yesterday, Adrian and I were talking about the Netflix version of A Christmas Carol, the animation version, which includes like a, almost like a drag queen esque uh, scene in it, which is horrible. Um, it, why can't they learn? I mean, Tom Cruise seems to get this, and he's I mean he's not even I mean he's Church of Scientology for crying out loud, and yet he figures this out. But it's 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 they're kind of like they start to say, oh, it's because uh, it's a uh, it's a pilot movie. It's because of people want movie action with uh, with the spy, with the, with the really fast things. So they they really they look in uh, everything else except because I mean otherwise they they gotta say that's wrong. I'm wrong. I'm I'm incapable to produce this kind of material. So, I mean I don't know. I don't have that knowledge. Therefore. I have to point it to some, something else. I mean, they, they, nobody's going to do mea culpa, mea culpa. I mean, it's even within, uh, we see within our church, I mean, we, they, they, I mean, why the things are not changing? I mean, they're keeping going left uh, as, as, as uh, left as you can right. So it's just uh, this arrogance way to don't want to admit your own fault and uh, to keep in perse perseverance on their thing, thinking, I mean, eventually people that are going to change people's mind. I mean, there is this really a uh, manipulation, a set of mind. They think they can change people's mind. And I mean, uh, uh, and that's, I mean, uh, we should actually accept people for what they are. And, uh, and uh, as a filmmakers to aiming towards uh, where they are versus where, where you think you are. I mean, yeah. mm. you know, the chosen, you know, we mentioned the chosen a second ago, the chosen has become the standard for Christian films, raising money and the quality of Christian films that they can they can be. And it kind of freaked out Hollywood a little bit because during uh, Christmas time, they had a chosen special that was airing across uh, the, the U S and movie theaters and it outperformed many Hollywood films and yeah. they we're watching the the new avatar movie bomb I mean it still made tons of money but not compared to what they thought it was gonna make the new Marvel movies they're they're flooding money into them and they're not making the return that they are expecting to and a lot of people are talking about this as a something that the Hollywood should be concerned about but should this be a sign of hope for Christians what, what does it send signals it send to people in uh, your community Oh, I mean, I think absolutely. I mean, but most most of all, I think uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's the way that uh, they uh, they created the infrastructure for for showcase uh, the the movie. I mean, with the app. I mean, they were extremely smart to understanding that uh, you can no longer rely on uh, a, just uh, just on the movie theater. I mean, I I'm still hearing for so many people that to tell me, look, I mean, I'm not going to invest the in money if you don't if you don't put if you if you if you don't uh, uh, push you towards a movie theater. I said to say, are you one of two suicidal us? Right. Another virus is going to coming. Uh, nobody's going to watch it. I mean, why you don't understand the cost to go to a movie theater. You understand about the competition you have by going to a movie theater who owns the movie theaters. Disney, Paramount, all these people here. You think if you have a good movie, they're going to they're going to let, 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 let you down? It's like a, yeah. it's totally this so sit down back then movie. I mean, the way to think in it, that things supposed to be done. So people they told me they tell me they're not going to donate their money because if 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 we are not going towards the the road of uh, of the movie theater, so it's say, wow. No. I mean, I, why you don't learn? Why you don't learn? Why you don't see yeah. the chosen? The reason why they chosen this so well is because uh, they create a platform. Now, yes, I mean, they were able to go to the movie theater for a period of time, but that was just because, I mean, there is no pandemic uh, and they already have a structure that, I mean, no matter what is going to back them up. But, I mean, they're still, they're still doing on the, yeah. on the, on the, on the app. I mean, they didn't abandon the app. They didn't yeah. say, they actually got a new app structure i mean so yeah. it's distribution like is a, 
crucial for the future for Catholic evangelists who want to create content that is both entertaining and inspiring. And we can't depend upon the, the distribution structure of, of traditional media that doesn't like what we have to say or what we want to teach. Which reminds me, we have a couple minutes left now. Neil McDonough and his wife have announced, uh, these are Catholics in Hollywood, and uh, he has long since rejected roles that he could have taken and made him a lot of money, uh, but he wouldn't blaspheme God, and he wouldn't have uh, sex scenes or kissing scenes with other actors in any of his films. So he and his wife have announced that they are going to produce films that embrace Catholic values, some overtly, some subtly, but nonetheless, they want to create projects, films, entertainment that inspires and enlightens. What say you, Angelo Labuti? Uh, I think it's fantastic. I'm, I'm so want to meet him so badly. I mean, I think he's such a, like a <laughs> great, a great man. And I mean, uh, he's been proved. Uh, we're kind of hoping to, to have in a gala, to have in him uh, as well uh, on board. I mean, I suddenly we never cross, we don't never cross the, our road together. I mean, I'm trying to get in touch with him with some friends that they know him. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I admire him because, I mean, it's like a, a rival point that, I mean, uh, I'm glad that people wake up and start to like just stand up and just stay and, and understand it. I mean, that's the only road to go for it. You can no longer, the, we went so woke that if you're waiting, if we're waiting, I mean, a uh, uh, some of those those companies start to try, try to promote in these movies. I mean, it's just madness. They, they, they are so far uh, against our values and stuff. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, uh, and they, suddenly the church support too. I mean, as we see with uh, with our president, and I mean, uh, that uh, uh, nobody uh, saying nothing to him, and then it's mm -hmm. really destroying everything. I mean, we, we've been doing, yeah. Yeah, we have to, I think, as Catholics, support the effort to create content that, uh, as I said, upholds our values, I mean, it doesn't always have to be explicit. It can be subtle. Artwork is that way yeah. often. But yeah. nonetheless, if we don't support these uh, efforts, boy, what does that say? If all we do is go to Disney films or, or subscribe to Netflix, but we don't financially back the organizations, the, the, the groups, uh, the Catholics that are trying to create something that is truly beautiful and inspiring... Shame on us. Shame on us. And to that point, EucharisticMiraclesMovie.com. EucharisticMiraclesMovie.com is the website. Angelo Labuti, God bless you. God love you. We'll continue to nice pray to for you guys. your project. We look forward to talking to you next time. Merry Christmas. Merry All right. Christmas, Coming up after the break, August, Mayrod is gone. Our church is becoming anti-family. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Christmas Minute. Since we are all children, we all associate Christmas with Christmas presents. G.K. Chesterton says that everything looks better when it's a gift. A gift is something we don't deserve. If we deserved it, it would not be a gift. And that's why the only possible response to a gift is gratitude. And that is why we hear in the Mass, as we will hear at Christ's Mass, we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks. Everything we have is a gift. And that is why Chesterton says, thanks is the highest form of thought. That's why the word Eucharist means thanksgiving. The best kind of giving, says Chesterton, is thanksgiving. Want more than a minute? Visit us at Chesterton.org. Hi, I'm Debbie Giorgiani. And I'm Adam Bly. We're the hosts of The Spirit World every Saturday morning on the Guadalupe Radio Network. Join us as we help answer your questions on angels, demons, and how the physical and spiritual worlds interact. That's The Spirit World from the Station of the Cross Studios every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Central, right here on the Guadalupe Radio Network. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. Adrian Fonseca here, keeping you informed and inspired. And today is Wednesday, December 28th. And on the fourth day of Christmas, or the uh, My True Love Gave to Me, four Collie Birds. And now more headlines. Former Pope Benedict is very sick, Pope Francis says. Pope Francis said Wednesday that his predecessor, Pope Benedict, is very sick and asked for prayers for the 95-year-old 
former pontiff, I want to ask you all for a special prayer for Pope Emeritus Benedict, who sustains the church in his silence. He is very sick, Francis said during his general audience at the Vatican on Wednesday. Let's pray for the man in Rome wearing the white cassock and the red shoes. That would be Bishop Ratzinger. And Disclose.tv says Ukraine Zelensky says his government is preparing to participate in the Klaus Schwab's, you know, the, the James Bond villain guy, his World Economic Forum in Davos next month. And the people are asking, who's surprised? Technology Review says a startup says it's begun releasing particles into the atmosphere in an effort to tweak the climate. A startup claims it has launched weather balloons that may have released reflective sulfur particles in the stratosphere, potentially crossing a controversial barrier in the field of solar geoengineering. Geoengineering refers to deliberate efforts to manipulate the climate by reflecting more sunlight back into space. Little is known about the real-world effects of such deliberate interventions at large scales, but they could have dangerous side effects. The impacts could also be worse in some regions than others, which could provoke geopolitical conflicts. What I don't get is how can I have a carbon footprint if I drive everywhere? Daily Wire reports women rakes in the dough teaching scared Gen Zers how to actually talk on phones. Mary Jane Copps is raking in thousands of dollars for teaching Generation Zers, who have spent most of their lives only using text, to have actual conversations via telephone. Business Insider published a report Monday on Copps, who has dubbed herself the phone lady, revealing that she charges up to $480 per hour for private lessons and phone etiquette for those who either don't understand how to use a phone in the workplace or have a phobia around doing so. And in other news, I'm available for consultation to Gen Zers on how to talk to people. I'll be charging half of what the phone lady is charging. Fox News reports, judge dismisses Massachusetts parents' lawsuit over school gender policy, scolds district disconcerting. Judge ruled that schools withholding gender issues from parents failed to shock the conscience. Mastroni said Massachusetts law recognizes gender identity as a personal characteristic deserving of protection from discrimination and does not provide exceptions to permit parents to override a school's decision to support students who identify as transgender or gender nonconforming. Addressing a person using their preferred name and pronouns simply accords the person the basic level of respect expected in a civil society generally, and more specifically, in Massachusetts public schools, where discrimination on the basis of gender identity is not permitted, he ruled. I was going to insert a joke here, but the public school system is the joke. Daily Wire reports, Elon Musk on big tech censorship, Google frequently makes links disappear. Twitter CEO Elon Musk said in response to the latest release of the Twitter files Tuesday that Twitter was far from the only big tech company that engages in online censorship, going as far as to say that Google makes links disappear on their search engines. In other news, fire is hot and ice is cold. And those were your headline news this morning. God love you. <laughs> Praise be to God in all things. Thank you, Adrian, for keeping us up to date in spite of the fact you hate your microphone and you keep punishing it. But nonetheless, uh, joining us right now via telephone is August Merat. He has an article out at Crisis Magazine entitled, Today's Churches Increasingly Anti-Family. Very interesting read, and I think a lot of family, a lot of younger families probably, for sure, could appreciate this article over at crisismagazine.com. Good morning to you, August. Good morning. Praise be to God. Did I get your name correct, by the way? Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> you probably say that to everybody. <laughs> you probably never correct anybody on their name, but nonetheless... No, uh, no it's fine. It's good. Well, we are glad here. Merry Christmas to you and to your family. Uh, thank you for taking the time to jump on, uh, jumping on and having this conversation. I was thinking as I read this about, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago or so, uh, I was at a Mass, and I want to say it was even a daily Mass, if that... And uh, some friends of ours were there with their little ones, and their little one was not having the greatest day, banging on the pew or whatever, and Father just gave a scowling look from the, from the altar. And then after Mass, sort of scolded them. Well, they never came back after that. They went somewhere else. And uh, to this day, they remember that very vividly, how unwelcome they felt uh, at the slightest uh, I I you know, instance of noise or whatever. This is a real problem for families. It, it is, um, and I, I didn't have something as dramatic as that happened to me, although, no, there, there are a lot of occasions of when your little ones, your toddlers to church, 
and uh, you know they they act up or they're loud or they they bang on a pew or something like that. Um, and it's momentary, but you know you, you feel like everybody here is good and everybody's looking at you. Yeah. Um, and well, I mean, and, and I was just thinking, you know, did I feel welcome here? <laughs> you know, um, I mean, I, just uh, on a bigger level, you know, just hearing the sermon, hearing the music, hearing, you know, the whole experience of going to mass. Um, it, it changes a lot when you have kids. When you become a parent, you experience it much differently than you do. Uh, when you're just a single person uh, yeah. trying to understand everything. Oh, you know, it's it was a couple of things you wrote in there that I just chuckled at. One was how, uh, you know, single people will sit at the end of the pew, making it harder for moms and dads with their crying kid to get out of the pew as fast as possible <laughs> to, to uh, avoid the embarrassment of the situation. I mean, I just thought that was hilarious because how true that is. Uh, uh- no, I mean, that was the main inspiration for the article. I mean, maybe that's bad to say, but every time, uh, every time I go to Mass, it um, doesn't seem to matter what parish it is, uh, they are always at the end of the queue, and in the back pews, too, you know, and I'm like, why? <laughs> so you see this chasm, <laughs> this wide open space uh, right after them, and to me, that's just, I, I can only think, well, they want to get out quickly, uh, <laughs> and it's convenient to them. And, no, I, I think I, I really wish that other parishioners, you know, and I'll say the same for myself before I had kids. I don't think I was really that cognizant of it, but they need to realize that, okay, there are other people here, and there are other people who have kids or they might bring their, their parents or something who might be elderly. Uh, you know, so I'm going to make it easy for them and I'll be in the middle, you know, I'll be in the middle, I'll be at front, um, so that they can have easy access in and out of the queue. Uh, just kind of common courtesy and kind of awareness of spatial awareness, uh, that's really lacking and it's never addressed, never addressed by the priest, never addressed by, you know, kind of, you know, church organizations or anything like that. Yeah. And Another thing I was thinking about while reading your article over crisismagazine.com is how new parents, you know, uh, first time, newborn babies, they just the slightest whimper and they're like, oh, got to get up, got to walk out. And I just laugh. I'm like, it's fine. It'll be okay. They're not really disturbing anybody. But nonetheless, as new parents, you feel very intimidated by the slightest noise and disruption. Well, and I think a lot of that is kind of the messaging of the priest and the church uh, of the parish. And I think I've only heard one, one sermon in my entire life as a Catholic, and I'm 37, so I've been going um, for years and years and years. And so I think I've heard one sermon where the priest actually explained what are the proper, what's the proper protocol uh, if you have a squirming or crying kid. You know, he said, <laughs> okay, you know, wait seven seconds. If they don't settle down within seven seconds, sure, get up, go walk around or go to the cry room or whatever. Um, but, you know, and that, hey, that was invaluable. I mean, I didn't have kids at the time. I think I was like a teenager or something, and I was hearing something like this. But I've never heard anything like that. Uh, and I think and that to me is like, well, why don't we address this? We have announcements about potlucks. We have announcements about this. We have sermons about some stuff that is pretty abstract, but... We never have any kind of thing to, to tell parents and parishioners, hey, this is how to act if you're a parent. This is how to act if you're not a parent, but you see other people like that. You know, make room for them and all that kind of thing. It's like, how easy would that be? But it doesn't even dawn on anyone to say something like that. Yeah, I think one of the reasons why this happens so often where the priests are not doesn't talk about this kind of thing is because any time a priest brings up kids or brings up family life and things like that, he always gets the uh, the parent that comes out afterwards and be like, Father, you don't have any kids. How can you talk to me about what I should or shouldn't be doing in the pew with my kids? Uh, so I, what do you think about the disposition that the lady should have whenever a priest does bring this topic up? Well, you know, you'll hear that sometimes. Um, just from well, non-Catholics mostly, you know, or either they're Protestant or they're just kind of secularists, and they'll just say, "Well, priests can't understand my situation because they're not married or they don't have kids." Um, 
I mean, to me, the, the same kind of argument is saying, well, so you're not going to go to a doctor because they don't have cancer like you, or <laughs> you're not going to go to the, <laughs> you're not going to go to a teacher because they're not ignorant and haven't done the stuff like you, you know. Uh, so I, I, I mean, I think we can understand if a priest has wisdom to impart. I mean, and they are spiritual fathers; uh, they can say a thing or two about it. I, I, I mean, of course, you want to be sensitive as a priest um, or pastor. You know, just trying to explain, you know, what are the rules and all that. And I, I think there's a way to do it. Yeah, to me, I think that the, the big challenge is. You know, you want to welcome parents. You want to welcome families. Hold that thought right there. We're up against a network break. August Mayrot is our guest. He has an article at Crisis Magazine, crisismagazine.com. Today's church is increasingly anti-family. We're talking about that, and uh, we have to point out the differences between traditional and non-traditional communities. That's coming up next. Hey, Donnie, when we see Christ on the cross, what do we call that? A crucifix. And who said, preach Christ and Him crucified? St. Paul. As parents, we're the primary educators of our Catholic faith to our children. And if you don't know your Catholic faith as well as you should, that's okay. Just tune in daily to the Guadalupe Radio Network by logging online to grnonline.com. The Guadalupe Radio Network. Listen, learn, love, and pass it on. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question for your non-Catholic friend. Your only daughter met a fine young man who was a committed Mormon. She now wants to join his church. What's your answer? Well, here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Number one, a reason for no. Doctrinal positions such as the deity of Jesus and the Trinity. Your reason for yes. You deem seemingly moral character as superseding biblical truth. Secondly, orthodoxy. Your answer is probably no. But how and why? Your resistance to Mormon doctrine does not just come straight down from the Bible. It comes from the first five centuries of brilliant theologians, bishops, and popes. These Catholics wrote, debated, and fought for truth. Example, in 250 AD, 311, and 417, three different popes excommunicated three different heretics, Sibelius, Arius, and Pelagius. They denied the Trinity, the eternal deity of Jesus, or taught that human effort warranted salvation. Would your pastor excommunicate a heretic? Well, unfortunately, your pastor can only remove someone from his local congregation. But that's okay. That guy will probably end up being welcomed at a church down the street. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. Keeping you informed and inspired, I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Coming up at the top of the next hour, for those of you that can join us, David L. Gray is going to be our guest. He has an article coming out at 1 Peter 5 on 300 years of changing attitudes within the church to embrace compromise with evil. Uh, join us for that conversation if you can. But uh, August Mayrot is our guest right now. He has an article at crisismagazine.com. Today's church is increasingly anti-family. Welcome back to the program, Mr. Mayrot. We're grateful for your time today. Uh, again, very, I think, good article for a lot of people to read. In many cases, these churches have sort of like a you can't uh, interrupt whatsoever uh, on one side of the, perspe- uh, the spectrum. On the other side of the spectrum, though, like in more traditional communities, I was making this joke a few weeks ago with some uh, with a family who sat in front of us on the pew, and their, and their kid was very you know, loud and rambunctious or whatever, and they were apologizing like, it's fine. I said, listen, here, I mean, the kid could practically murder you, and the priest would never even wink, wouldn't even bat an eye, wouldn't, nobody would question it. We'd just keep rolling. It is funny that there are big differences between traditional and non-traditional communities when it comes to this. Yeah, well, and it's kind of intuitive, too, because, you know, in a traditional parish, and I attend one when I can, I mean, most of the time, and they, uh, well, it's more, it seems more strict, it seems more solemn, it seems more serious, so how would it be good for, you know, parents and little kids? But I think the big thing is that, well, first, you have a lot more families. I mean, it's, it's just a demographic kind of thing. I mean, it's just a much, usually a much younger audience. Uh, and much bigger families, and so you'll have, you know, all ages being represented, not just the elderly or the middle-aged, um, which is different from an English order parish where really, you know, you're the exception if you do have little kids. Um, and that's an issue of its own. But I also think that in a traditional parish, uh, or TLM, traditional land mass parish, um, they don't pander. And so that, that's what I was kind of getting at before the, the commercial break was that 
there's a difference between, you know, welcoming a person and pandering to them. And I think the church has kind of resorted to pandering to young people and maybe young parents uh, with the music, with, you know, the, maybe some of the sermons and stuff like that and, and some of the aesthetics. And whereas in, in a traditional Latin mass parish, they don't do that at all. And it actually feels more welcoming. They, like, they take you seriously uh, and they preserve this liturgy and just kind of the beauty of it. And it still can be spiritual and still can be um, something real, you know, uh, for the person going. So I, I, I think that's a big part of it. I mean, and even the, even your children, even young children are impressed by it. And I, I think there's more done with the senses, you know, just what you're smelling, what you're hearing, what you're seeing, um, that engages the kid, or it maybe not as an engage them, but it helps them understand you are in a, you know, sacred space. And so you don't act up. I mean, they'll still act up, but maybe not as much as they would in a church where they're singing happy birthday and they're clapping and, and that kind of thing. Just about a decade ago, my family and I were contemplating switching to another parish, uh, one that was more traditional. And we were attending a mass down there. And one of our little ones was making some noise. Wasn't I, I would say not too bad, but making some noise. The usher walked straight up to my child, not even to me or to my wife, and shushed them in front of us. <laughs> and uh, I was incredibly offended by that. I, I was really put off. I could not believe that, uh, that you, they would do that. And I think it demonstrates kind of what you're talking about, that how there's a balance in act in all of this. You don't want to, uh, you know, I always, with my kids, I try to get them to, behave and be respectful of those around who are trying to pray and to be uh, focused on the sacrifice of the Holy Mass and uh, how incredibly selfish it would be for us to, to interfere with that. And so we work on that. It's a, it's a process. But at the same time, I'm also very tolerable of everybody around us. I mean, uh, I, as we just said, we, we, it's amazing how much we can tolerate when we just offer it up. And yet these, so a lot of these churches, they simply... They don't understand that balance, and it, it does feel very off-putting. Yeah, and I think it's just understanding. Well, you know, and I think about the deeper issue here. It's like, how, how do you identify uh, as a Catholic? And I think, you know, in, in the old days, you know, I would say 50 years ago plus, uh, Catholics identified as family people. You know, you, your parents, you have kids. Uh, and so... You know, you, you kind of spoke to people in that in that mode. I think now that nowadays we kind of identify ourselves as like autonomous adults uh, without really a, any many attachments, uh, even parents. You know, I mean, unless you have a lot of kids. Uh, I mean, that's actually kind of the joke too. It's like if you have one kid, I mean, you still act like you're a, a, you know a, a childless couple, and you can kind of get away with doing most of what you did before you had kids. But once you start having two kids or three kids and plus, you know, more than that, mm. then you'll start thinking more as a parent. Uh, so no, I mean, for sure it's a balancing act, but I think a lot of it has, is tied to identity. I mean, how are you seeing other Catholics? Uh, I think in the old days you saw them as other, you know, parents just trying to, you know, raise families and kind of living sacrificial lives. And so you're willing to be more charitable and more patient. Uh, but if you're looking at yourself as a Thomas adult in the suburbs, you know, upper middle class or whatever, uh, you start to have less patience for that kind of thing, and you don't understand children too well, and you don't know how to communicate uh, certain expectations. And so it just everything just feels offensive. You know what I found very odd um, when I first started seeing this happen? I started going to a, a parish that exclusively does the traditional Latin Mass, and one thing that I noticed that it was, I just thought that was the weirdest thing was that people would take other people's kids and just walk off with them. And I was like, wait, what? That is, what are they doing with that person's kid? That, that person's not related to them. Wait, that person, they're not related to them. And they'll just go up and one of the families will have uh, eight to nine kids and one of the just random lady will come up and be like, oh, here, I'll take your kid and just walks off with the kid. And I'm like, where, where's she going? Why are they letting her walk up with that kid? And, uh, and I started, as the longer I was there, I realized that 
the people just became so tight knit and they they love babies they love children a lot of these older parents and even some of the younger kids that are 15 16 um, they'll just go up and they'll just take care of the kids during mass to help the parents out and I was just was blown away by that I didn't comprehend it at the time and I just think it's amazing have you noticed that and what do you think about that that sounds awesome. <laughs> uh, I'll see that. Uh, you know, my wife and I were very envious <laughs> of people who have that kind of help. Uh, and a lot of times, that's usually how it works. You're always wondering, like, what are these big families doing when they have one of five kids? Uh, and the, the age range is so so much. And but what they do is usually the elder kids will, will act as kind of child care. Uh, you know, will help with child care and help with the little ones. And they love to, you know, I mean, it's, it, for them, it, it, it's new and fun and exciting. <laughs> um, or also they'll be close with their parents or their siblings, uh, you know, who are also adults and they can take care of the kids. So I, I think the family dynamic is much more at work. Uh, and I think that's, that's the way things were in the past, you know. Uh, I mean, even Jesus gets lost in the temple. Uh, you're like, Mary, Joseph, how'd you lose your kid? Um but I think it was that same kind of environment where, you know, everybody knew each other and you had a lot of extended family and you could kind of trust and trust other adults to, to watch your kids. And, and it's a great thing. It's a huge, immense relief for parents. And really, as a Catholic church, uh, I think a lot of parents should try to really get back to that uh, instead of, you know, and I think COVID's hurt that a lot, too. I mean, I, I think you have to insert that all the time. Uh, when we're having these conversations, it's just COVID has made people very distrustful of each other. People don't want to shake your hand. I mean, I'm still kind of encountering that too. That was another inspiration for my article is that, you know, you do the sign a piece uh, at a Novo Sordo kind of mass and, you know, they'll just wave at you or do the, the peace sign and look at you uncomfortably or they'll be wearing their mask still. And, uh, and so, you know, <laughs> you, you, you can just kind of, you just feel it. You know, okay, I, I get it. I'm not, I'm not clean or something. I'm a leper, I guess. Um, so, no, I mean, I, I think that's a great story. I, I think it's, and that's true. You, you really do start having, like, you know, the family units extended beyond just the, you know, blood relations or just direct family. You start having extended family or you start having neighbors. Uh, and really you're, you're returning to what the, the church used to be or what a church community used to be where people really were connected. And children do that. I mean, that's the beauty of a family is that children bring people together, uh, even people that don't have kids themselves, they can come in and help, you know, either giving gifts or, or watching the kids and, uh, you know, establishing those relationships. Mm. Uh, we have just about a minute and a half left here with August Mayrot about his article. What would you say, August, about, what would you say to a parish, to a, to a priest, pastor, uh, about how they might be more family friendly here? What could they do to increase family friendliness? I think um, try to be more welcoming and try to be less pandering. And remember that these are people in your parish, and I think you always want to defer to parents and defer and respect the sacrifice that they have taken on by having kids because it is not a popular thing nowadays. Uh, They're giving up a lot. They're being discouraged a lot in every other, you know, most other spaces and all that. So I would say welcome those parents, speak to them, speak about them, um, you know, always so that you, you care and respect for them and try to think of programs and ways to facilitate, you know, going to Mass and developing a spiritual life, you know, get the dads together, get the moms together, try to build up that community and speak to them. Just, I mean, just even sermons about this stuff and avoid pandering. Don't do the Christian rock. Don't do the cheesy hymns. You know, just do normal stuff, take them seriously, um, and that would be kind of just what I'd encourage. Mm-hmm. Wow, we're just about out of time here, and I was just thinking about uh, the things that we have done as a family to help our kids be better behaved at Holy Mass, not bringing food, limiting toys. And if I have to remove them, I don't let them down. I don't let them run around. We don't go to the cry room and run around. I I will hold them. The fastest way to getting to sit next to mommy is behavior. Uh, That's the lesson I always taught our kids. That, and I guess uh, Benadryl and duct tape works like a charm every time. 
I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I don't actually. It's a do little that. bit of tequila. And no, no, no don't do kidding. any of that. No, I'm teasing. But nonetheless, uh, August uh, Mayra, we're grateful for your time today. God bless you. Thanks for your article. Thanks for uh, chiming in on this uh, important subject. Yeah, thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you as well. You can check out his article over at crisismagazine.com. That's crisismagazine.com. August Mayrat, uh, M-E-Y-R-A-T. Great stuff. He's got a whole bunch of articles over there, by the way, I'd recommend. All right, uh, that's going to do it for hour number one. If you can join us in the second hour, I would surely love to have you on board. David L. Gray is going to join us, and he's got an article coming out from 1 Peter 5 that deals with a bit of history, infiltration in the church, 300 years of changing attitudes, Freemasons, and so much more. Join us if you can. Go to grnonline.com forward slash. CDT. Otherwise, we'll see you back here tomorrow morning. Planning on shopping online this year for Christmas? Did you know that you can help the Guadalupe Radio Network when you do your Christmas shopping online? All you need to do is shop on Amazon Smile and 0.5% of your purchase goes to the GRN. Just go to AmazonSmile.com and select La Promesa Foundation as your nonprofit of choice. La Promesa is the parent company of Guadalupe Radio. It's that simple to give some extra help to the Guadalupe Radio Network during the holiday season. I had a personal experience that was life-changing for me. My husband of 21 years decided to leave um, our family, me and my girls, and um, in the midst of the absolute horrible heartache, I happened to be flipping through the radio one day on the AM channel because I didn't feel like listening to music, and I happened to find Catholic radio. And ever since then, I have been tuned in religiously, and I feel like I have a really, really strong pull to the Catholic faith. The Guadalupe Radio Network would like to thank those listeners who have supported Catholic Radio financially over the years so that we could be there when Terry needed us. If you would like to support your Catholic Radio station, please visit grnonline.com and you can click on the Donate Now button. Again, we sincerely thank you for helping us to be there for Terry and everyone else that needs God's love. Each of us will be asked to review the movie of our life and give an account to God. We will sorrowfully relive the bad times and joyfully revisit the good. Thankfully, no matter what you've done, there is hope. Since Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save it. So if you've been away from church for a while, we invite you to come home and find the peace that only comes from God. Visit CatholicsComeHome.org. Are you on the CDT Insider email list? Hi, Joe McLean here, and every week I send you cool stuff straight to your inbox, goodies that you're not going to want to miss. Go to grnonline.com forward slash CDT and get signed up today. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. Informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Oh, yeah. I wonder what uh, camp you fall in when, when the kids start screaming, fussing, crying. Even camp just, retreat. Even just a little? Are you in the uh, get them out of here immediately camp or are you in the uh, ah, it doesn't matter? You know, it's almost more distracting whenever the parents get up and leave every time the baby starts fussing just a second. Well, with little infants, they hardly make, I mean, it's really not that bad. When yeah, it comes that's what to, I'm like, saying. Infants, I'm like, the babies? But new time, first time parents, like, I think they start to learn with kid number two. I think six. Uh, no, I think by kid number two, you, you figured a few things out. But kid number one, you're like, Oh, they're making some noise. We got to get them out of here. I'm like, no, it's fine. Stay. It's okay. Like they're barely, barely, you could barely hear them. Uh, but uh, when you, when you've got a kid screaming and crying, well, then, you know, you got to do something. You can't not do anything, but there's a balancing act in all of that. And the pressures on parents, it's like, oh man, I feel, I always feel bad. I always feel bad for parents who are feeling the pressure, but you got to work those. Uh, you got to work those uh, behaviors early and often. Speaking of which, David O'Gray uh, is on with us all the way from Germany. Praise be to God! In what looks like to be a very exquisite library, was that uh, cherry wood? 
mahogany? What are we talking about, David O'Grey over there? It's like only the only the best will do for you, apparently. Very nice. Good morning and Merry Christmas. Guten Tag. How's it going, gentlemen? Uh, Guten Tag. Good. That's good. French for good. good morning, right? Good. Das ist gut. Uh, <laughs> Uh, praise be to God. Uh, how was your How was your Christmas so far? Yeah, first Christmas in uh, Germany was uh, it was fifty degrees, so that was really nice. What? And, um, I thought it'd be cold. Yeah, in Germany. Just it was really just laid back. You know, we really couldn't afford to go any come back home or anything like that. So yeah. we just just stayed here and and, and um, uh, hot chocolate and Ooh. you know just just did yeah. the thing. You know. So uh, have have you enjoyed? Like uh, some of the delicacies, like uh, the better part of uh, bratwurst or like uh, French fries with mayonnaise. I mean, like what? It, like what's the most exquisite German food you have had so far? Um, probably pizza at Pizza Hut. I just discovered. What? Yeah. Stop it. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> who goes to? Who, no. who goes uh, to? What kind of a man goes to Germany no. and eats Pizza Hut for crying that out loud? That sounds great. <laughs> Now, I think um, I think I really I, do, I really do like schnitzel. I do. It's hard to find because mm-hmm. I don't eat pork, so it's hard to find schnitzel with veal or chicken. But yeah. when I do find it, I, I definitely always go for the schnitzel. Mm-hmm. I do like this thing they do with beer. They put the put Coca Cola in beer. I think what? they call it beer cola or something like that. Uh, Coca Cola really and hey. beer. That's new yeah. To me. That sounds awful. They do awful. everything with Coca Cola here. It's weird. They, they'll put it in like an old fashioned, which you know is disgusting. It's just. <laughs> Yeah, they, they'll do weird things with cola here. It's yeah, amazing. Okay. Yeah. Where, all right, let me ask you. So, the uh, straw poll here, where do you stand on the meter when it comes to tolerating the noise of children at mass? Oh, um, I have I have a pretty high tolerance. Okay. I, I really yeah. do. I, I do. I, don't you feel bad for father, though? Because yeah. he's up here trying to give a decent homily. <laughs> and, you got, and you got, you know, you got the kids over here. And yeah. just, <laughs> yeah. just going to town. I, I gotta I, tell I you, feel bad for father sometimes. Uh, at our previous parishes, uh, you know, there'd be very little tolerance for noise at mass, uh, and then at the parish I'm at now, it's an incredibly high tolerance. I don't think father even notices. Somehow he's had his ears altered to tune out the voice of children because, like. They could be screaming bloody murder, and he just keeps cruising along. They just keep going. Doesn't bat do an eye. Do you remember a story not long ago where a priest had told the people to quiet their kids or leave when he was doing his homily? Do you remember the story? Oh, no, I missed yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, that would have been me if I was a priest. <laughs> 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 uh, Listen, well. I worked. I worked all week for the homily, you mm-hmm. know. And I come on. <laughs> oh, sure no. you did. Or, okay, Father, <laughs> you worked all week, huh? Wow. <laughs> if that's your best, all I'm saying. I tease. I'm teasing. All right. Anyway, you have an article coming out over at One Peter Five. I read it this morning. Uh, praise be to God. Thank you for sending it over. Three hundred years of Masonic infiltration. Three hundred years of changing attitudes within the church, sort of cooperating when they feel it's convenient to do so. What's the story here? Yeah, so what I wanted to do, um, Joe and Adrian, was oftentimes, you know, there's some Catholic circles, you know, that we have where we would like to reduce what we call an infiltration down to maybe just one event, maybe to like people like the narrow down to like maybe the Alta Vendetta of of the Carbonari. And they they published that document, the Carbonari, the Alta Vendetta, saying we're going to infiltrate, we're going to put our own pope in place. And people like to reduce it just to that one event. Like that's when the whole thing began. But typically when something goes this bad, this wrong, um, it usually can narrow down to just one thing. So what I wanted to do in this essay that's coming out 1 Peter 5 this week was really just to put this whole thing like a, a context over the last 300 years, beginning with Pope Clement XII and his nephew Neri trying to tell him, you know, Clement wanted to put out this papal bull in enmity saying, you know, a Catholic cannot be Freemasons in 1738. And his nephew Neri was like, hey, you know, those Freemasons over there in England, they're not like the ones in Europe. You know, they're just having fun and things like this. Hmm. And and it's that type of myth, really, that you see still today in the Catholic Church. You know, you still have Catholics saying, or making the same case as Cardinal Neary saying, oh, you know, Freemasons are different. You know, you know, the ones in Europe are different than the ones in England. Not when it comes to Masonic principles. You know, they may be different in their attitudes and their externals, but... 
it's still Freemasonry. And so it, it really started then. I really, and so in the essay, I tracked the whole thing up going from there and until the, during um, World War II and until mm-hmm. post Vatican II and all the way up to today, showing how the Catholic Church, every time they had, well, people in the Catholic Church, some people, every time they had an opportunity to make friends with Freemasons, they chose to make friends with them rather than um, enforce the condemnation against Freemasonry. Yeah, that's that's so true. And I mean, I'm thinking of uh, Blessed Pius the Ninth and his uh, relation with the Freemasons before he kind of had a conversion. But you know what you said there about it, trying to reduce the revolution to one event. That's one of the reasons why I really like, and I talk about this often, Professor Plinio, uh, because he talks about the revolution and the Masonic revolution. And there's one element of the revolution. You have the Protestant Revolution. You have the uh, the French Revolution. You have all these different revolutions happening, and they're coinciding with one another. And Professor Plinio just coins it as the revolution to try to categorize it easier. But it's not can't be reduced down to just one event. But I, I do I do want to ask though the Do you know uh, the the background behind uh, Blessed Pius the Ninth all the way back then with um, what is that Saint um, What's his name? Uh, the one, the pap- the saint of children, and uh, John Bosco, uh, the John Bosco and his fight against the the Freemasons during his time. No, my, I, I know I'm very familiar with Pius and Ninth during his liberal years. Um, you know, he comes in, he's a pope. The he, the liberals supposedly put him in place because of the work he had done as a cardinal. They thought he's going he's going to be their ally, and he was for for quite a while until you know they you know he realizes that you know you can't really be friends with these people, and they try to kidnap him and all that stuff. And so, but before all that, before he turned became more you know sort of conservative, um, he had actually. Um, uh, it it's, took a stone from the resources of the Vatican, sent it to the United States, and this stone was going to be used as, a, as the cornerstone of a Masonic edifice to be built to George Washington. So, oh, um, wow. and so his his thought it seems to be that you know mm. make friends with your enemies. Also, all, but although there are some rumors that he was a Freemason during his youth as well. So, mm. um, th- there's a, there's a lot of pieces there. You quote Pius the Ninth in your article uh, by saying clearly uh, he taught in 1873 in Esti Multa the Church teaching does not distinguish between sects of Freemasonry. Teach them that these decrees refer not only to Masonic groups in Europe, but also to those in America, in other regions of the world, close quote. Now, what I found interesting about that is you and I have discussed the Freemason issue on several occasions. You are a, you're a, a past Freemason. I'm a past Freemason. You are a pretty high-ranking Freemason as, compo- as opposed to me, who's just a lowly third-degree Blue Lodge guy. Uh, but and, you're, always, you're always being so self-deprecating. You're funny. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, my, the point I'm trying to make is I do see some distinctions here because a lot of times we'll talk about Freemasons and people will listen and go, come on, my uncle, my dad, my, my, my cousin, my neighbor, my coworker, they're all good guys. They wear funny hats and drive little go-karts at parades and try to raise mon- money for hospitals and they do charitable projects. So you guys are exaggerating things. Uh, how could we be exaggerating things, David O'Gre? Because I think that is part of the success of the Masonic program. I think they've been very successful at creating this image that they're just some fun-loving people. I think the Shriners with the, their little cars and their hospitals, I think they've, they've, that's gone a long way to promote the image that these are just guys that, um, and we, we enjoy, you know, we know these guys, you know, have been Freemasons. A lot of guys are, are just trying to get out of the house, maybe spend some time with the fellas, get away from the wife. Hmm. But it's the teachings of Freemasons the philosophy, the ideology of Freemasonry that is what is um, anti-Catholic and dangerous and harmful to the soul. So I I get it how the how the vase of Freemasonry is, doesn't look dangerous at all, but you sometimes you just have to look inside that vase and, and see what's really going on. It's a snake that's about to come out and choke you on the neck. Yeah. You know, David, I was talking to a friend of mine recently, and I just want to get your analysis of this situation. He told me that a friend of that, uh, that he works, so he works at a Catholic organization, and this Catholic organization decided to go to an explicitly Shriner restaurant for their Christmas party. 
and the, it's in the name. Shriner is in their name. And if you go to their website, they have their food and everything, but they also have like how to join the Shriners on the side on their website. So it's like very, very explicitly. And I didn't even know restaurants like this existed. And he was telling me about this, and I was like, I don't know. Like, if I had a waiter who was a Freemason, I wouldn't make a deal about it. I just, you know, pay the meal and give him a tip and no big deal. But it, I don't know how I feel about patronizing a restaurant or if the GRN had patronized a restaurant for an official Catholic like Christmas party. That'd be so weird to me. What's your analysis for that? Yeah, that it sort of shows a little bit how teaching this 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 case I'm making in this essay, how teaching has been watered down over the years. There was a time with Clement the twelfth and um and Leo all the way up to Leo the thirteenth that you could not as you you would be excommunicated for giving any commerce, any anything to Freemasons. You could not house them, you could not be around them in any way, you could not do anything with these people who were considered to be enemies of the Catholic Church. But nowadays, you know, you got the Shriners hospitals, you got their bars, you got their circuses, you know. And and so it's uh, but you know, it's it, this isn't only the only discipline you know that we we watered down over the years. But yeah, I, I think mm. I think um, we should be very cautious towards giving the resources that God has given us to agencies and organizations that invade against the Catholic Church. In your article, you said all sects of Freemasonry have always been prohibited because they all hold fast to the dogma of indifferentism and the belief that Freemasonry is man's highest good. And I think there's some subtlety in that, some nuance, that I believe a lot of guys like myself in the Blue Lodge went right over our head. Like, we were we were swearing oaths that we didn't really realize the gravity of the words that came out of our mouth. We were yeah. participating in rituals that we just didn't seem to pay much attention to the actions that we're actually doing and how they may contradict what we believe as Christians. Yeah. And cause that's, that's what it is when you're at that altar, you know, you're, you're you have the blindfold taken off. You just have that guy who learns the worst master is saying, you know, repeat after me. And you're just, you're just saying these things, um, after him, you know, and these strange oaths and, and things like that, the Catholic church, you know, as far as the post perspective, that's really not, uh, concern in regards to a person can do evil or do um, in, uh, participate in those who want to invade against the Catholic Church, knowingly or unknowingly. And so the popes have always wanted, especially Leo, to make have the bishops and the priests make Catholics aware of these organizations and, and what they're teaching and how it is contrary to what the Catholic Church is teaching and our soteriology, our salvation, that it's not your own human works that are going to make you a better person. Mean, it doesn't matter. You making yourself a better person it's through Christ and his grace through which um, promotes our holiness. And so we've, I think we failed all along, um, mm. especially the bishops and the priests in the church, to really keep this message out in the forefront that people are losing their lives and their souls, at least damaging them yeah. um, and their families by participating in these, in these rites. All right. When does this article come out? It'll be this week, Joe. Thanks for talking about it with me. All right. Adrian, happy God. New Year. 1 Peter 5. Look for David L. Gray's article at 1 Peter 5 this week. Praise be to God. Merry Christmas to you, David. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Go find some strudel. Tell us all about it in the next, next week. All right. We're going to play our game Fear and Trembling. It's coming up next. You could win. It's going to be fun. You might learn as well. Call right now, 877-757-9424. The phone number is 877-757-9424. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Christmas Minute. Have you ever heard people object to gold and gilded ornaments in a Catholic church? Have you ever heard them question the purpose of burning incense? How do we answer them? Simple. We answer them by pointing out the three gifts of the wise men at Christmas. If gold and incense can be brought to a stable, they can certainly be brought to a church. What do these three gifts mean? G.K. Chesterton says they represent three prophecies about the Christ child. Gold, that he should be crowned like a king. Frankincense, that he should be worshipped like a god. And myrrh, that he should be buried like a man. The first two are marvelous and obvious. The third is a wonder. Want more than a minute? Visit our website at Chesterton. Org. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Christmas Minute. 
Are you worried about the war on Christmas? Don't be. G.K. Chesterton says Christmas is the irresistible festival for those who are afraid to be festive. It is the spectacular festival when almost everyone lives and acts poetry instead of just a few people writing it. It is the ancient festival, a trinity of eating, drinking, praying, that to modern seems irreverent because the holy day really is a holiday. No matter what happens, says Chesterton, the great majority will go on observing Christmas Day with Christmas gifts and Christmas benedictions, and they will continue to do it, and suddenly, someday, they'll wake up and discover why. Want more than a minute? Visit us at Chesterton.org. Welcome to another round of fear and trembling. The Catholic Trivia Game Show that helps you work out your salvation by the seat of your pants. It's a 50-50 chance and prizes are involved. Avoid the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Call now to take your shot. 877-757-9424. And now your host, Joe McClain. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time and fear and trembling. A Catholic trivia game show with secrets and agendas that you can't tell anybody. You've got to promise, promise me you're not going to tell anybody. Now, what I need more than just telling you all my secrets and agendas is a phone call from someone who wants to play the game. Could be you. You could win. It's possible. Call right now, 877-757-9424. That phone number is 877 877- Seven five seven nine four two four. If it's been a while since you played, you're welcome to call back at eight seven 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 five seven nine four two four. Adrian Fonseca standing by to take your phone call right now. Praise be to God. But there are a few things, like I say, that we do on the down low, the QT. We just don't want anybody to know. So promise me you won't tell anybody. But number one, we like to teach the faith. So we look for teachable moments in the questions where you might just learn something you didn't know before about your Catholic faith. Praise be to God. It's always a good thing, right? And then, of course, we like to have a laugh, a chuckle, a good time. And our callers are amazing. They laugh with us, and sometimes they even cry with us. But nonetheless, we enjoy that most. And then we give out prizes, which means this is a winner for everybody involved, because you can get something out of this. You can either learn, laugh, or win. And some people do all three at the same time, praise be to God. Uh, but here's the kicker. The secret sauce in all of this is we do not ask the caller the questions. So they don't need to know. In fact, they may not know any of the correct answers, but could still win our game. Now, typically, I would ask Adrian and Rudy these questions. One would give us a right, and the other one would give us a wrong. But since Rudy has gone back to California for the week, praise be to God, enjoying his vacation, well, uh, we've changed things up while he's gone. Instead, what's going to happen is Adrian is going to ask me the questions. Because some have been spreading false and ugly rumors, vicious lies, I would argue, that I somehow can't be trusted. I am, in fact, the only trustworthy member of the team. Therefore, I wanted to give this opportunity to prove that uh, the, the callers could trust me on this. So I will give an answer, and they will have to decide, am I trustworthy? Am I not trustworthy? Look, I would never, mm-hmm. never mm-hmm. call Joe a liar. Mm-hmm. But I also ain't calling him a truther. Mm-hmm. That's all I'm saying. Mm-hmm. That's all I'm saying is all. Well, the caller will have to decide. And if they get that right, they go into the coffee cup of Divine Providence to win this week's prize, which is, in fact, a CDT prize back. Now, p- previously, previously on Fear and Dribbling, you were told by Rudy Carlos himself that we were out of all CDT mugs, duplicates of the original coffee cup of divine providence. However, I had a personal stash that I've been saving, stocking away for a rainy day. Well, that it's raining outside and today is the day that I'm going to bust one out, autograph it and mail it along with a price pack of goodies to include books and other things to the winner for this week so you could win. Praise be to God. Let's go to the phones. Uh, let's see here. Avila, good morning to you. Cynthia Avila, good morning. Good morning. Praise be to God, Cynthia. Where are you calling from? San Angelo. San Angelo. Uh, the only thing I remember about San Angelo is the, uh, the the tumbleweed. Massive, huge balls of tumble. I thought that was fake until, I, I mean, I, I watched spaghetti westerns growing up, and then I went to San Angelo. I'm like, oh, no, that's real. Oh, my. 
Uh, that's a thing. Uh, do you guys ever hit them while driving your cars? Is it dent your vehicles? I mean, it seems pretty serious. No. no, we're just passing through. No, we're just mm. passing through. So, okay, you just okay. So you're not from San? Where are you from then originally? San Antonio. Whoa, now you know, Cynthia. San Antonio is uh, is famous uh, for other reasons besides me having gone to high school there and being the 10th grade history student <laughs> of the year at Justin High School. You do know this. There's other reasons to enjoy the great city of San Antonio, of course. Of course, of, of, of course, it's, it's known for other things. That's uh, what for, she says. For a few she's, other she's things. She's like, yeah, of, of course it's not because <laughs> Joe McClain went to high school there. Uh, if, well, what do you mean? It's a primary reason, yes, mm-hmm. but there are secondary right. reasons. Now, mm-hmm. Cynthia, where do you go to church? Holy Spirit. Holy Catholic Spirit. Church. Praise be to God. Now, are you familiar with the rules? Do you know how all of this is going to work today? Yes. Well, you sound very... You're not confident there, Cynthia. I want you to be very confident, because today is all about trusting yeah. me. Right. It's all about trusting me today, Cynthia. Don't trust them. Trust me. Don't, don't I'm do the only, it. I, I'm don't all do you got, don't Cynthia. Don't do it. So, uh, are you ready to play? Yes. All right. All right. That's a little more confident. There you go. I, I felt that. That's all right. I think Joe should ask himself if he's ready three times. I am I ready? Am I am ready? I ready? Am I ready? Am I really ready? Yes. Yes, I am. Okay. Well, here we go. Question numero uno. Got it. French again. No. Why would you? No. Sorry, no. Right. That's that's Swahili. So, oh. Yeah. That's that's Swahili for number number Mea one. Mea culpa. Clearly, mm-hmm. uh, you obviously haven't been up to date in your languages. Yeah. Uh, the question is, mm-hmm. what famous Catholic? I see. Painted okay. the creation of man. Oh, I see. Mm-hmm. What famous Catholic painted the creation of man? Yes, sir. That would be none other than the one and only Michelangelo. Michel, like Michel and Ultra? Uh, no. Like, uh, as in uh, Michelangelo. Like the turtle. The um, Ninja Turtle. No. Uh, okay. Mm, like Michelangelo. Okay, so, mm-hmm. um, Cynthia, mm-hmm. Joe seems to think that the mm-hmm. answer is Michelangelo, not Michelangelo, but uh, Mi- sorry, Michelangelo. It's, it's an inter- interesting pronunciation. It's Michelangelo. Uh, mm-hmm. What say you, Cynthia? Michelangelo, Michelangelo, was he the one who created the, mm-hmm. who did the painting of the creation of man? Is Joe mm-hmm. lying to you? Is he telling you the truth? Uh, what say you, Cynthia? It's Michelangelo. Survey says. Yes, of course. Joe over here trying to pronounce it in Swahili. (laughs) I mean, Italian. (laughs) Michael, or Mikkel, as a lot of people say, Michelangelo is the correct answer. You are in the cup. You could win. Cynthia, you're already already proving your expertise in all of this. Uh, especially with that first question, but uh, well, don't worry, Cynthia. We're going mm-hmm. right over, yeah, to numero dos, and which is I, I. I'm gonna say this. Mm-hmm. It's easily the hardest question of the last seven days. <sighs> this is so easy. Mm-hmm. This is the <laughs> easiest question we've had ever. I mean. Yeah, if you consider all the questions we've asked, sure, but not in the Mm. last seven days. Maybe, maybe. Be warned, Cynthia. Be very warned. Alrighty, Cynthia. Numero dos, okay, which is uh, mm-hmm. Taiwanese. Wow, for number two, that is amazing. Yeah, people don't realize I know so many languages. I, you are yeah. a linguist. I know, I really am. Expert really am. in linguist linguisticology. I have a PhD in all languages, according to Twitter. Um, yeah, all languageology is Got what it. they call it in, okay. in my field. Mm-hmm. Uh, what term mm-hmm. refers to the four basic natural virtues okay. that all the other virtues center upon? Huh. Okay. So, uh, what term refers to the four basic natural virtues? I'm going to say that there is a clue hidden within the question itself. Oh. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Four. Four. Being that clue. Okay. Uh, we're going to we're going to say that the correct answer here is virtues. Fortress. Fortress. Okay, is that Taiwanese? Uh, I'm gonna say it's Latin. Oh, okay. Fortress is okay. the correct, is correct answer. All For, right. Fortress. 
Mm -hmm. Well, Cynthia, mm -hmm. uh, Joe seems to think that the term referring to the four basic natural virtues that all other virtues center upon mm -hmm. is called the fortunes. Yeah. Uh, what say you, Cynthia? Awesome. Is he telling you the truth? Is he lying Sorry, to you? What? Is he right or wrong? Sorry. Cynthia, what say you? Hmm. I don't agree with him. What? You don't agree with him. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, did I hear yes. whispering going on? In there? fact, like, is somebody somebody googling the answers? You, 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 we have now <laughs> no. confirmed, but we cannot trust Joe McClain. There's no phone a friend on this game. But Cynthia. yes, the answer, in fact, is the cardinal virtues. Cardinal mean like the the, mm -hmm. the basic, the directional. So when you think of the four cardinal directions: yeah. the north, south, east, and west, you got the four natural virtues. Mm -hmm. But that puts you in the coffee cup of divine providence twice now. But let's mm. move along Yay. right mm -hmm. over to mm -hmm. question number Trace. Trace. Okay. Everybody so knows that that's... Mandarin? No, no. That's ridiculous. No. Why would it be Mandarin? I don't, it's, it's obviously ASL. Oh. American Sign Language. Got it. Yeah. Trace. Yes, Trace. Sign Language. American Sign Language, wow. yes. All right. Clearly. I'm learning something new. Yeah, everybody, everybody needs to learn something new. All right. Let's the do it. The term is... The question is, rather... What term okay. refers to the small round skull yeah. cap oh. worn by the clergy? Oh, I've seen this before. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. On Daily Wire, the guy on Daily Wire um, wears a yarmulke on his head. Oh, oh, oh. a yarmulke. Okay. Um, yeah. Cynthia, uh, Joe seems to think that the term referring to the small round skull cap worn by Catholic clergy. Mm. Is called hmm. a yarmulke. Uh, what say you, Cynthia? Is he right or wrong? Is he telling the truth? What say you, Cynthia? No. What? No. Cynthia. That is correct. <laughs> it is actually called a zucchetto. A zucchetto is what the but clergy come wear. On. The guy who wears the yarmulke did talk to a bishop once or twice. This is true. This is true. People <laughs> who go, are Jewish wear yarmulkes, but Catholics <sighs> wear zucchettos. Zucchettos. Cynthia, you're amazing. You didn't fall for any of the tricky curveball questions. You played like a champ. You're in for three. Perfect score, Cynthia. Well, well Thank done. You. Praise be to God. Congratulations. Well, uh, try to avoid those big, huge uh, balls of weeds that just randomly fly through the streets of San Angelo. And stay on the line. Yeah. We're going to put you on hold, okay. Cynthia. God bless you. Thanks for having a laugh with us today. We're going to be praying for your day. Thank you. Sit tight. That's going to do it for the radio side of our show. If you can join us in the after show, maybe I'll share with you my sneaky secrets to getting your kids to be quiet during Holy Mass. Or maybe you can share yours with me. I would love to hear them. You can hang out with us at grnonline.com forward slash CDT. Do not forget to pick up your car raffle tickets to possibly win a brand new Mercedes. grnonline.com. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to facebook.com. Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's Facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to the after show, where we, as usual, get a lot more casual, creative, interesting, in the conversation, so uh, if you're new here, brace yourself. It's a lot less structured for the next 30 minutes. Uh, we are only on our social media feeds, on the live video feeds, Rumble, YouTube. We're also on Twitter, Odyssey. Uh, we cross post to a bunch of places as well. And uh, it's just very casual and relaxed. You get to drive the conversation in the direction that you wish to go. So you just gotta leave a comment and let us know what's on your mind. Praise be to God. Good morning to you, Ben Thorpe, a.k.a. Abel. Welcome to the program. A Amy W.C., good morning to you. Tonya, good morning to you. Sean, Yvonne, Lights 10, good morning to you. Tammy, welcome. Uh, it's good to see you again. Praise be to God. Glad you're here. Sharon, uh, how is New Hampshire doing? How is New Hampshire faring in the weather right now? Uh, with Buffalo being utterly pummeled. They're not all that far from you. So how much snow did you guys get? How cold is it up there? I'd love to know. Let me know. Uh, 
Alibi in Angeles, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Praise be to God. I see T-Storm was on earlier. Nancy, good morning to you. Thanks for being on. Welcome and good morning. Rumble's in the house today. Gunslinger Damon is over there. Weber Sue Webb is over there. Clarissa is over there. Praise be to Jesus. Sharon Felton is also over there. Good morning to you. Our, uh, our Telegram group, by the way, is also on board this morning. I see Mike K. Mike, Connecticut. How'd it go? Let me know. Praise be to God. I see uh, our friend uh, Tammy's over there. Clarissa's over there. T-Storm is over there as well. Damon is over there. I see Josh Patterson was over there earlier today. Praise be to God. And others, if you're hanging out with us on uh, Telegram, make sure to chat. And let us know. T-Storm's still there. Good morning. So do you, how do you guys, where do you guys land on the spectrum, on the perspective, on the meter between can't stand voices, uh, loud children's voices, any children's voices in church, they should all be locked up, or the other way with you paid zero attention, you could care less, couldn't care less rather, on how much noise they make. Where do you stand in that hotly contested debate? Let me know in the comments. Tammy says, Joe and Adrian, you need to show the new commenters, commenters some CDT love. Oh, I see. We have gotten away from our traditions, our patrimonies. We've become modernists, uh, Tammy. I should say Adrian has because he controls the board. So people talking about me while I'm gone. Yeah. You, uh, you become a modernist. I am not a modernist. I will play our traditions. That's not mm, the true tradition, Tammy. Maybe you can remind him what the actual tradition is for welcoming the original, for welcoming new brand new commenters. Tammy, do you remember? Does anybody remember? Nope. That is also not the actual tradition. What was the original? Nope. Zero, negative, nada. Good morning to you, Peter. Thanks for hanging out today. T-Storm says, uh, let me know in the comments what, y what you think the original way in which we welcomed brand new commenters is. L uh, nope, still not right. Uh, there is a conspiracy afoot here to forget, to ignore, to erase Speaking of conspiracy. the actual way we, in we welcomed brand new commenters in the beginning. And uh, let me know in the comments. t Storm says, here is something that I learned with small children at mass. I used to take a handful of laminated prayer cards. I would punch a hole in them, and then I would attach them together with a binder clip or a key ring, and they would have a little packet of holy cards to look at during mass. We do that too, t Storm. I, uh, Definitely something we've been doing for years. I advocate for using the forget me stick. <laughs> Uh, that was a the forget me stick. The forget me stick. Yes, mm. I will show you guys what I mean. The uh, my my buddy was uh, talking about how his his son. Uh, he was like, "Why on earth does this kid, no matter what, no matter how dark it is outside, mm. no matter if I put him in the darkest room with blackout blinds, he still gets up." At sunrise, no matter what I do. And I told him, I was like, what you need to do is you need to use the forget me stick. And he was like, and he started laughing his head off. And I was like, I can't believe you got that joke. Uh, but I'll show you guys what the forget me stick Laura is. Laura says, I don't like the noise, disturbance, but I am also happy that they are at mass. Amen. Praise be to God. Well said. I think a lot of people like Gloria and... Uh, and Mike Kay, our friend the brick wall, have pointed out if, uh, you know, if they ain't crying, it's dying. Basically, churches that don't have a lot of noise don't have a lot of kids, and that's not a good sign for the future. Banji245, welcome back. He's right. He gets the, you are correct, the horns are the actual tradition of patrimony of Catholic Drive oh, Time for welcoming oh, brand new commenters. What are we talking about? And yet, Adrian, the modernist, still refuses to... The horns of the apocalypse. Welcome back to tradition, Adrian. I don't think that Does was the first good? time. I don't think that's Is, what we did. Is it feel, yes, that's exactly what we did. I, I need to see proof I, of that. Because remember, I had, the, the, I had my phone app, and I would hit the button myself back in those days. Mm, I no, you made it with your also, mouth. No. Well, I did that. No. No, I didn't do it with mouth. I did the, uh, I had the button and I would press the button 
and then I would say it. It's like I did right now. And then mm. I stopped using the buttons, and then you have all the buttons, and then mm. you failed to press the button anymore because you prefer the ska version of Jesus' a friend of mine on, because man. you, in fact, are modernist. Modern. Come on, man. So, truth is out. People know now. Well, there you go, folks. There you go, folks. Benji. I still think Banji, it up. Ba- manage, manage, manage 245. Well done. Well played. Praise be to God. Crown Royals in the house. Good morning to you. Uh, Bandage245 also says, I don't care if children are naturally crying, etc. Parents do need to handle misbehaving children. Amen to that. But I don't believe in the crying rooms found in some Nova Soto or in traditional parishes as well, by the way. That is not good. So, you know, I'm in the middle. Obviously, I've got a bunch of kids. I've had little ones cry, fuss, and disturb people. I've, I know what it feels like to be on, on that, in that situation. It's uncomfortable. But I'm also firmly in the camp that parents ought not to let their kids run free in the pew. If your kid is used to doing whatever they want and you don't manage that process. You have to body slam them. Oh, sorry. It may have to come to that. It may have to come to that. I think that's a bad thing. You're, you're, you're basically encouraging the behavior in that regard. And that is very, very distracting. To, to have a family in front of you where the kid is just bouncing all over the place and parents are like ignoring that. I think that is a problem. I think they ought to address that. And clearly, if the kid is really loud, like really loud, yeah, you got to get up. You got to take them out. You got to remove them. It's just the way it is. Just the way it is. But at the same time, you don't have to overreact. Every little noise does not have to be addressed. You know, every little fuss does not have to be addressed. They may calm down in a second or two, as Adrian said, seven second rule. I've never heard of a seven second rule, but nonetheless, you know what? Just to see how this whole thing goes. So. I'm going to give you guys a sneak peek for tomorrow's breaking news. The, uh, <laughs> Sharon, that is so true. We just found out that the award for mm-hmm. transphobe of the year has just been given out. And who won? Well, I'll tell you one. 2022? It's not me. Well, I'll try harder next year. But it was Matt Walsh. Not, not Matt surprised. Walsh is the transphobe of the year. <laughs> Unlike you, he put out a documentary on the subject. Yeah, apparently I need to do more to be labeled transphobe of the year. Kind of disappointed, but oh well. Sharon says, there is a look of death that only moms can administer. Very effective. I don't know. I would say uh, dads are pretty good at the look of death as well. Um, I don't know. There's a good, strong competition there for who's got the most menacing parent look. Cast over at the kid. My kids... <laughs> They know I've got the look as well. And here's the, here's the thing, though. So as dad, I feel like it's my job to manage behavior in the pew. And so one of the things that I, I have to, it's always kind of a battle with my wife a little bit. With, when it comes to toddlers in particular, like when we, have to, so we have to go into the pew already ready for action. So I always sit on the edge of the pew. That's always on the edge, aisle side, for a number of reasons. One, so we have quick access so we can get in and out. Number two, uh, if there were any security situations that would arise in the churches, and this is a bigger issue these days than it ever has been in the past. Then you want the moms or the babies closest. You need, you need dads to stand up and address that security threat right away. And they don't need to be stepping over anybody to make that happen. They need, to, uh, they need to react as quick as possible. So there's a couple of good practical reasons there. But number, number three, you need the toddler next to dad. You can't have the toddler two people over when the toddler starts fussing, crying, and causing a, a stir, and dad needs to address that situation. He doesn't need to be reaching across people, further accentuating, and toddlers are smart. I mean, like, this is how we get politicians and lawyers for crying out loud. I mean, they know. Uh, they know the deal. They're not dummies. They start to manipulate things super fast, and they they know that dad is gonna gonna get put the clamp down, and so they up the antics in hopes to manipulate your emotions because they know like dad does not want to be embarrassed by anybody. He wants to keep this thing quiet. I'm gonna go the opposite right direction here, and I'm gonna stir things up even more and intimidate dad. But that that don't fly in my book. Kid gets snatched. We're going to snatch that kid straight out of the pew. And we're going to take him to the back. And uh, he's going to be, I want to go with mommy. Okay, fastest way to mommy is to stop fussing. 
if you can stop fussing and remain calm, cool, and collected, then we can go back and sit in the pew next to mommy. But you're going to be sitting next to me and in between me and mommy the whole time. You don't get to go uh, a person too removed. And my kids were always smart. They're like, I got to put as much people in between me and dad as possible so that I could play in the pew and fuss and horse around and like, nope, tank going to happen. Not on my watch. So I was always, I always felt it was my job. I believe, and I firmly believe it's dad's job to help the, the toddlers learn the behavior of how to sit quietly and respectfully in the pew, even though it's hard for them. It is hard. They don't fully understand. It's a long time. It's hard for a boy to be sitting that quiet, that still for that long. I get it. That's why you let them run around after. Burn off some of that energy. Or right before, burn off some of that energy. But while they're sitting there, nope, they got to learn that lesson. It's up to dad. Banji245 says, yeah, in my family, dad was the final arbiter. If dad put his foot down, end of discussion. Poof. Yay and amen. Damon says, yeah, I definitely have the more effective look compared to my wife. <laughs> I feel like my wife is a little bit of a pushover. Uh, like She like puts up with a lot more shenanigans than I do. That's for sure. Um, uh, what is, I'm trying to read Mike's my comment here. My kids don't make a single peep during Mass. I just want to point I that. have heard that your kids are I mean, remarkable. Uh, they are remarkable mm -hmm. at Holy Mass. I have never heard a single complaint about my children. Not a, Not single, a single one. one. Um, ever. Ever. Mm -hmm. I haven't even heard of a complaint about your wife, in fact. Uh, now that I think about it. It's true. Not even one. It's true. Not a single person has said anything negative about my wife. Not one person <laughs> no, on the planet. Not no, not one. It's true. <laughs> can confirm. Uh, ben says, uh, local parishes can be great walk to and from church, church-less wiggles. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. I'm sure there's something in there, though. And he says, I don't, I don't know. My sister is the one who took off in mass, climbed underneath pews, and, and uh, head popped up a few rows ahead. <laughs> That's hilarious. There was uh, one little toddler in our church this, earlier this year. Mom and dad were letting that boy run up and down the center aisle, the center um, aisle there. And like, I was afraid the kid was going to run up into the sanctuary and up to the altar. And I'm like, come on, dad, get in the game. You got to go wrestle that kid go in. body slam him. You know, uh, and then there was a kid a couple weeks ago. And I'm not saying this to disparage mom at all. I, moms, college you is, the stress and the deal, what they have to deal with. But there was a kid that ran off. He was running outside. During mass, he ran off outside. And he, he did not want to have to go to mass. And so he was running around the campus. And, uh, you know, and I'm like, Where, where's dad? So like the, like his brothers, his older brothers had to come out and try to wrestle him to get him to come back because mom was inside with the other kids trying to deal with the kids. I don't know where dad was. Maybe he was inside. Maybe he was not there at all. I don't even know, but I felt bad for mom, to be honest. My heart broke for, for, for mom on that one because, you know, she's probably wrestling a bunch of kids and, and that, that, that's a dad job. Dad's got to go put the kibosh on that stuff because little boys go out of control super fast when dad allows it. Tammy says, I bet it's like Adrian's kids aren't even there. It's almost. It's almost like that. It's, it's uh, true. It's super close to that anyway. It's very much like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, T-Storm says, the problem with making church a fun for kids, making church fun for kids is that they're going to grow into teenage and adults who expect to be entertained. Yes. A hundred percent. We are not there to be entertained. We are there to offer sacrifice. Yay, nay, man, T-Storm. I agree with this. If we set an expectation where they have to get something out of mass every time, this is a bad expectation to grow into a uh, teenage and adulthood with. We are there to give, not to receive. And, um, and if you are incapable of periods of quiet and calm, Boy, you're gonna be a spoiled little brat. You're gonna you're gonna have bigger problems, bigger behavioral issues to deal with. So, I mean, there's always a time and a place where we have to be calm, cool, and collected. So, it's a good, valuable lesson, just in a practical sense, to teach kids these things. Yeah, the only problem with being calm, cool, and collected is that, um, for me anyway, 
he usually would then fall asleep. Yeah, that's tr- that's tough, isn't it? I mean, midnight mass, everybody was falling asleep. I, got, I looked over and I'm like, man, look at all these that snores. Was rough, <laughs> man. I'm like, <laughs> I I fell asleep standing up at one point. It was really bad. <laughs> I was standing up. I was. Uh, when when was it during mass? I want to say it was during the credo. Yeah, they were singing the credo right, and they were using the um, they were using the solemn tone. For the credo, because you know solemnity, so they're using a more fancy tone for it, and it was a long credo, and I'm just standing there, and all of a sudden, I'm like catching myself on the pew, and the credo's <laughs> uh, more than halfway over, and I'm like, what happened? Like what? I was like, I just fell asleep. Right. You I didn't, just felt, like, you I didn't, didn't even know I didn't know that I fell asleep. I just yeah. I was just out. That's great. And I was falling, and I was like, oh my goodness. I did not fall asleep. I was simply meditating with my eyes mm. closed. Oh, um, so funny. <laughs> Speaking of which, my um, so yesterday last night I had the privilege of uh, having jumping on a Zoom call with my former novice brothers. They uh, we were all we are in a group chat together now, and so we've just been talking. And one of the brothers, former brothers, is actually entering the Fathers of Mercy. Uh, he's going to be a novice there, and he uh, and so he wanted to hop on a Zoom chat and chat with all of us before we. Um, before he left, he leaves on, he enters on January 6th. And so we were just chatting and just reminiscing about the novitiate. And um, they were talking about how one of the brothers, uh, Brother Aaron, would uh, smile too much during the office. And uh, that he got uh, chastised by one of the uh, senior members of the community for smiling too much during the office. He's like, you know, you have to be more solemn. You can't just be smiling the whole time. And um, and I was like, yeah, I never had that problem. I was always <laughs> meditating during the during the office. And they're like, yeah, yeah, exactly. You're meditating, right? You're you're in the yeah, seventh heaven, I, I, right? It's right. Exa- I was in ecstasy. Uh-huh. Yeah, I was in ecstasy. That's all it is. That's all. That's it all. Is, that's all it was. It's, 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 I definitely was not sleeping. Yeah. I, I would not do that. You know, it's when you're really exhausted, and it always amazes me how easy it is for me to fall asleep, like at adoration. Like I could literally be have I could have a gallon of coffee, have rested well last night, totally full of energy, but I'll go into an adoration chapel and I'm like struggling to stay awake. I could fall asleep so fast, so easy. Uh, and I'll never forget though, I've had that experience before. One of the one of the experiences similar to this was when I went to boot camp and they keep you up for like two, three days. They don't let you sleep because they want you to acclimate while they're gathering all of the other recruits into a holding platoon and before they drop you into training, they keep you awake. And by like day number two, we would fall asleep and we would not know that we were asleep. Like it would just, all of a sudden we would wake up and we never even realized that we had passed out. Like it was just that rough. So I can appreciate what that's like, but nonetheless, um, with kids, going back to kids, it's important for dads to, I think, lead the way when it comes to that. And never let your kid run around out back. Ever, ever, ever. If you got to take them out, hold them. Hold their hand if you have to when they get too heavy to hold. Hold their hand. Don't let them run around. Don't let them have that freedom. They got to learn. I still recommend using the forget me stick. Or Benadryl and duct tape. Works like a charm. I'm teasing. I don't actually do those things. <laughs> Jeff Burrier, welcome and good morning, like, my friend. He's like, I don't want them to uh, the call yeah. CPS on me. Yeah, I'm teasing. I've never done that. Yep, happens to me in the adoration as well. It's because we're in the presence of the Lord. Yeah, I mean, but then do you feel guilty about it, Jeff? Like, I get that you can, you should just be present, but some part of me feels like I can't just allow myself to fall asleep. Like, it just feels. Yeah, it's not so. Like, I, I, I'm sure God is not, like, going to, like, hold me accountable. But at the same time, like, am I putting in effort to you keep watch with the Lord? Yeah. Or, I mean, like, you know what I mean? Like, I can't just allow myself to, to you know, quietly go off to a nap. You know, it just feels, it just you, doesn't feel appropriate. You should stay awake. You should stay awake. But, you know, I mean... I fall asleep all the time. It it's, happens. It happens. So it's a great place. Yeah. To, I mean, you feel I mean, really at peace. Praise be to God. But yeah, you you definitely should stay awake if you can. I mean, I'm I'm not judging anybody because I do it all the time. Yeah. I, I I rarely can make a holy hour without falling asleep at least a 
at least for momentarily. Yeah. So no judgment here. <laughs> However, yeah, we should we should stay awake. We should it, attempt it be, to try to stay yeah. awake as best as we can. That, uh, that's the whole idea is I like, keep watch with him. Yeah. Could you not wait one one and hour with me? I, I feel so. like that's the challenge. Like yeah. that's the temptation that we're faced with. Is uh, are we going to fight back against the urge to to rest to to be at sleep? You know, it's a tough one for sure. Uh, Bandage two forty five says yes. Yeah, spanking is good. Dad spanked me once when I was six. Never had to do that again. Yeah, that's where the that's where the look comes in, right? You know, dad dad technique. You know, you have to have the uh, the the craft, the uh, field craft of dadding. You gotta you gotta master that look. You gotta be able to give them the uh, you know and. You might want to look at the greats like uh, The Rock. Learn how to give that uh, that eyebrow. You know, you just got to give. You got to just glance at them, and they know you mean business at that point. Amy says a new topic: Is snoring worse than crying? The old guy mm. who dozes off in the pew a fixture at most churches? Yeah, it, it's <laughs> definitely worse. It's definitely worse, especially if it's a grown, it's a grown adult, or if, even if it's your kid. If your kid falls asleep during mass and he starts snoring, yeah, you gotta wake him up. Yeah, if he's sleeping during mass, no big deal. I think that's great. But like, um, but if he's snoring at some point, God, I can't do it. If you're the the real elderly, like if Benedict XVI, which by the way is not doing well, let's pray for him. Ninety five years old, if he fell asleep at mass, you wouldn't wake him. Right? I mean, who wakes the Holy Father up? I mean, if if you're number one, number two, but he's ninety five. He's not if you're ninety five, you're gonna you're, you're still not gonna going, bother them. And you're still going to mass, that's really impressive. Well, you'd want to go to mass, or obviously as a good Catholic, you'd want to go as best you could. But if you fell asleep, you know he's gonna wake up a ninety five year old. Similarly, no one's gonna wake up a two year old. Uh do two year olds snore loud? No. But I'm just thinking in the general principle of waking people sleeping. I think if someone is but snoring, a, but a 95 year old loud point, snorer, yeah, you're probably gonna you gotta wake them up. You're gonna you're gonna give them the nudge. Yeah, you have like, to. Pss, 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 pss. I mean, you don't have to like jolt them awake, but you just gotta yeah, and just gotta kind of like sometimes uh, my brother will be snoring, okay, and I will uh, smack him with a pillow. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll wake up just enough to stop snoring, but he won't actually wake up. Um, okay, let me throw right, another, let, like that. Let me throw another um, wrench into the works here. Okay, we talked about snoring. We talked about crying. What about people who, kicking the pew who hack a lung? Oh, people who hack up a lung during mass. Especially I mean, post-pandemic. I mean, if you can't help it, like, but do they, should they get up and walk out? Not if it's going and hack a lung elsewhere. Not if it's, a, I mean, how could, how do you predict that? I don't know. There's people who are hacking along and never seem to bother. And you like get like, up. Like, and like you get up, you walk out and you hack the lung like, outside and you come back in. I mean, that's like saying like you should sneeze, wait, sneeze outside. It's okay. Like, if you were sneezing once, who cares? Twice, sure, whatever. Three times, maybe six, seven, eight, ten times. Yeah, it's time to consider getting up and walking out. Hmm. I don't know. I think uh, if you can, if you know that you're going to be like going mm -hmm. into a fit mm -hmm. and you can feel it coming on, then yeah, I can understand mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. leaving. But I mean, if you, uh, I mean, if you just have it just happens, I mean, they're not going to get up in the middle of your coughing fit. And Why not? It's the same by with the, the kid. time you get out a of the room. A loud kid, you get up in the middle of because, a loud kid. Yeah, but the loud kid's probably going to be loud for the next five minutes. Yeah. You cough. You're not going to mm -hmm. cough for five minutes straight. Mm -hmm. By the time you get out the door, you're going to be done coughing and walk right back in. Maybe. Maybe you should just sit in the back if you're going to be so, hacking up a lung and you know right. you're going to be hacking we up a lung. We should reserve the ends of the pews for people who are going to be coughing. In the very back ends of the pews, not, no, not no. towards the front. Not everybody can sit in the back in the ends of the pew. Some people will have to sit in the very far back like mm -hmm. and hack their lung. Hack up their, I mean, if you come to Mass knowing you're hacking up a lung, sit in the back. I mean, if you're sick, stay home, but... Well, I, I don't. You can be hacking along and not sick. Sci-fi Mike said, "Adrian keeps saying things that I start typing." You're welcome. <laughs> uh, uh, you guys have uh, of like minds, so I have never actually great seen Sci-fi Mike and Adrian in the same room at the same think time. Alike. So, but there fools is that. rarely differ. Amy says a coughing fit should step outside, even if it's a smoker's hack. Yay and amen, Amy. Ben says coughing and sneezing during mass became an insane social situation during the pandemic. Oh yeah, totally. People nuts. were like, yeah. 
paranoid. I, yeah, I don't want to go to that level of like thinking, you know, everybody's going to get the coof because this person's hacking a lung. But nonetheless, I just think it's like, especially if you're really loud about it, it's best to stand up and walk out. I saw a grown woman the other day talking about mass stories. I saw a grown woman. Mm-hmm. She was probably my age, probably 25, <laughs> 24, mm-hmm. who was bumping the pew with her shoe <laughs> and I was about to you were lose going mad. <laughs> my mind. I was like, if you were like four, yeah. I'd be like, just leave it alone, Adrian. It's not a big deal. <laughs> Gotta let it go. Deal. Gotta let it go. But it she's go. a grown woman. I was like, I can't no, I cannot. Any more? Oh, I was like losing. And, then, and, then, and so this is this was at <laughs> this is at midnight mass too. Oh yeah. And so this course, is somebody yeah. that like she's I, trying to keep herself awake, dude. It may be, but her dad was sitting mm-hmm. two people over from her, yeah. and he, like, I just like I was like I felt. I felt uncomfortable. All of a sudden, her dad <laughs> just turned to her yeah. and was like, <laughs> How's like, it I, was like How's it I was like, oh, my goodness. This, the guy, like, the, he was yeah. like, he, he was, it, it was like anger, but yeah. utter disbelief that yeah. his daughter, yeah. a grown woman, yeah. was banging her foot against right. the pew. Yeah, like, he was like absolutely disgusted hello. with her, oh. but at the same time, just like yeah. furious. I was like, oh, my Hold goodness. Hold on, though. Mrs. G points out something that has become an issue for me more recently. She says, also, someone sitting instead of kneeling, and you can't kneel yourself because you have to sit back. I mean, this is a real complex issue, especially I just when, kneel. You, when you're like, my you're gonna, size. You're going to have to deal with it. Because, uh, you know, it, it, the person in front of you wants to sit down, so you can't kneel and put your hands over the edge of the, of the back of the pew because you'd be into their back. And, and the, the pews are so tight anyway, and it's 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 hard sometimes. It's really really hard. It becomes very very awkward for a lot of people. Yeah, it's definitely a problem. I I would just kneel and just be like, well, you're the one that wants to sit, so now, you're gonna have to deal with me all up on you. Here's so. the thing though, <sighs> higher road principle. How shouldn't we all? Just offer up these inconveniences. I am. I'm just kneeling. Shouldn't we, with great grace, accept these disturbances, these annoyances, these difficulties with grace and humility? Isn't that what saints would do versus what we would do? All right. Even if it's right that a person hacking along should leave the room, because we all know it's right to do so. Uh huh. Uh, even if that's right, shouldn't shouldn't I just tolerate that? Like the crying kid. The, the, the banging on the pew, all of these things, shouldn't we just offer them up in humility as a penance and annoyance to us? We can offer, we'll offer them up as a penance. <laughs> 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 I'll offer them up as an offering uh, to God. That sounds a lot like a pagan sacrifice there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a slippery slope ben, right there. Ben Throp, a.k.a. Abel, said, Did you guys know that pews are an innovation? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, pews were created by Protestants. They're, they're modernists. They were, yeah, they were not in Catholic churches, which well, is why in well, you Europe, still go to basilicas. Yeah, in Europe, they don't have them. Not pews, and they, they you'll put see out chairs, chairs yeah, because people were like, they do they put need, out the people chairs. People were like, we need to sit. So, and frankly, I like the kneelers. Honestly, yeah, I probably would be down for getting rid of pews. You know, here's the trick, though. When you're a big guy, it's actually more comfortable to not have a kneeler to kneel directly on the ground because the throw space between your knees and the your ends of your feet is just going to be and your belly. Uh, it's just better. It's just overall more comfortable, even if you're on a, like a tile or a hard surface. Um, but in Europe, when you go to these basilicas, everything is made out of marble and concrete. So everything is super hard. And after a week of touring all these places, your feet are killing you. Uh, and there's no kneelers anywhere. You, well, except for like at a side chapel at adoration or whatever, there'll be like a kneeler there, but there's no kneelers in the pews. There's no pews. Not B-Y-K. B-Y-O-K. Bring your own kneeler. Yep. Can one bring their own kneeler to your? If you had a, uh, if you were at one of the churches that have no no pews, just carry a one pillow. Of those, like, yeah, one of those small pillows. Yeah. Ah, good call. Good call. All right, guys. God bless you. God love you. Tomorrow on the program, we're going to be talking about the King's speech, King Charles, and his speech on Christmas. The King and I. Gavin Ashton, Doctor Gavin Ashton, Ashton, 
who was a former bishop in the Anglican Communion, is now a Catholic. Uh, he's going to talk about that on the program tomorrow, so do join us. And I think also Dr. Paul Kengor is going to be on to talk about the communist subversion of Christmas. Kind of love it. Praise be to God. All that and more coming up on tomorrow's show. Join us if you can. Share us with a friend. God love you. God bless you. And until then. Jesus is a friend of mine. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is a friend of mine. I have a friend of Jesus. Don't do it. It won't get done. Do going. Do it. What up with that? What up with that? Come on, man. What are we talking about? Come on, man. Go, Brandon. I agree. <laughs> hey. I did it. I did it.